Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 203rd episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Mary Beth Kuzmeski. Mary Beth is the founder of Red Zone Marketing, a marketing consulting firm with a focus on independent financial advisors that are looking to implement actionable marketing strategies. What's unique about Mary Beth, though, is the particular research-based, evidence-based focus she takes to financial advisor marketing and the principle that marketing success doesn't have to be about doing something completely innovative and new and never seen before, but simply looking at what already works in the world of financial advisors and just adapting it as necessary to the specifics of your own business so you can get started and get to real marketing results more quickly. In this episode, we talk in depth about Mary Beth's research shows that financial advisors are actually doing now in the midst of the ongoing pandemic environment to adapt their marketing to a virtual and digital world. From conducting hyper-targeted email marketing campaigns using third-party email services and suggest some of the providers that advisors are actually using to do it successfully, to conducting virtual educational events with webinars and how to adapt your presentations to get better marketing results when you're delivering in a virtual format, to the rise of virtual client appreciation events that are less about conducting a celebratory event for clients and more about simply creating meaningful social opportunities in a pandemic environment where we've all been closed off for each other, whether it's virtual cooking events, virtual team meetups, or for one advisor, weekly virtual bingo for their clients and prospects. We also talk about how the pandemic has changed the nature of generating referrals in a world of virtual meetings, why it's so crucial to turn the video on and ensure that virtual meetings are still face-to-face with tips on how to get reluctant clients who in the past have preferred phone calls to actually start meeting with you via video, how video meetings make it possible to connect with clients more frequently in smaller bites in a way that can actually help keep the advisor more top of mind for referral opportunities, and how to get opportunities to meet with prospects virtually by offering second opinion meetings to encourage them to meet with you for the first time. And be starting to listen to the end, where Mary Beth shares her own journey of finding financial advisors as her niche as a marketing consultant, the way her first financial advisor client grew his business from 10 million to 200 million of AUM in just five years by focusing into a niche of his own, And how in the end, many of the most successful niches for marketing purposes don't come about by trying to mastermind the ideal perfect niche up front, but instead by simply finding a segment of clients you are already having some success with and going deeper and deeper and deeper until you look back and realize that what you've created is far more specialized and differentiated than you ever realized it could be. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Mary Beth Kuzmeski. Welcome, Mary Beth Kuzmeski, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Well, thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm really excited about today's podcast. So I feel like we we share kind of a, a unique affinity in the financial advisor world, which is marketing by color. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as many folks know, listening to the podcast, like we kind of have a blue thing going on with Nerds Eye View and Financial Advisors Success Podcast, uh, the blue shirt, the 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 blue brand on the website, the little like blue nerd icon. I know you you run a marketing consulting business called Red Zone Marketing, a wonderfully strong red theme to the brand. I know we have shared the podium at conferences where I am in blue and you are in red. You had like a full red dress on. And so, you know, I, I know like we have both lived sort of the interesting fun that comes from even just using color with stubborn consistency for a decade or two at a time produces a wonderful branding effect. You know, our color of choices happen to be blue and your color of choice happen to be red. So looking forward to the discussion today overall. I know we we also share kind of a viewpoint around the value of of marketing, of marketing your business, of finding ways to focus your business with marketing through niches and other ways to to specialize and differentiate, which I feel like starts with having a strong brand color that you own and lean into. So just really looking forward to the discussion today, talking about marketing and branding and colors and niches and specializations. 
Yes, I'm excited about it too. And you know, when I first started my company, I heard somebody say, well, if your name of your company is Red Zone Marketing, you actually have to wear red. I'm like, yeah, but I don't like red. Well, if you've named your company Red Zone Marketing, you've not given yourself any choice. So hence, red. Oh, interesting. So it wasn't like that wasn't necessarily a preference for you. Because I'll admit from our end, like, I only fell on the blue shirt thing because I think subconsciously, like I had a blue shirt. I liked it. It was the one I tended to pull off the hanger when I was going to travel at conferences. Then people teased me because they only saw me at conferences and I always had the blue shirt on. So I decided to just step in and own it. Yours comes from the other end. Like you didn't actually pick red because you liked the color red. You picked a business and then got stuck with the color because the <laughs> color right. was in the name of the business. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, red zone marketing is a is a takeoff of an analogy to football. And so I liked that. And then all of a sudden I had to have an entire part of my closet that is filled with red wardrobes. So <laughs> so so then so what's the evolution of red zone marketing then if you weren't sort of going after red in the theme in the first place? Right. So red zone in football is the final 20 yards before you score. And I was raised by a grandmother who I was her firstborn grandchild and she loved me because I was her firstborn grandchild and football. And so I spent enormous amounts of time with my grandmother and she would school me on the rules and the positions and the players and everything about football. And I loved it because I loved her. And when I started my company, I thought I want to, in the spirit of my grandmother, I want to have this connection to that football that I love so much, but not about the entire game of football, about where it really matters, because I think there's a connection to marketing. So sending out direct mail and getting a quarter percent response rate is not red zone marketing marketing. Doing something today that's going to produce a client tomorrow is red zone marketing. And there's lots of strategies that are more immediate and immediate gratification focused. And that's what we do at red zone marketing. And so there's a whole theme behind that, but it all started with my grandmother. Interesting. I, I like how you frame that. So the, the idea of red zone marketing and the kind of marketing focus you, you like to look at is not necessarily the Let's talk about your 10-year marketing strategy with brand evolution. Yes, that stuff matters and has a place, but but you're living in the world of, as you put it, of, of the red zone of like, okay, if we're on, if we're just a couple of yards from the end zone, like what do we need to do to move the ball forward from here to get to an end point? Like what can we do in marketing that moves the needle today and tomorrow, not necessarily puts us on a strategic marketing path for 10 years from now. And hey, we'll get some results when we get some results. Right. And, you know, there, there's a lot of good to be said about long term strategic plans. But in marketing, especially things move so quickly. Like I, I wrote a book 15 years ago. I had to take it out of publication because there's nothing correct in there anymore related to what we would do today in marketing, which is i.e. there's no social media in that book. <laughs> and so, right. you know, you can't have a book on marketing without having social media in there. So everything changes so quickly. I think that that theme also works in in just about any industry that's using marketing on a regular basis because it's got to work today and the things that work today might not be what worked yesterday. Well, and I, I think that's probably all the more apropos in the the pandemic environment that we're living in right now where you know, very directly, like a, a lot of marketing strategies we used a lot not so long ago just don't work and got broken or at best have to be materially reinvented in a in a pandemic environment where just networking events and client appreciation events and seminar marketing and a lot of those kind of staples of the financial advisor marketing world either don't work now or at least have to be substantively reinvented in a very different way. Like, yes, we can take a seminar marketing strategy and try to turn it into a webinar marketing strategy at, at for the basic strategy level, but the the actual way you implement and do that is pretty much completely different at every step of the process, except maybe the presentation itself that might still be the same presentation. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. And that's what we've spent the last six months doing is figuring out what will work, what does work, and just in continuing to look at that over and over again, because it is so much different than it was you know, just a little while ago, I I, re, I was talking to a friend of mine recently, we were talking about the beginning of the year. And I'm like, man, that seems like 10 years ago, January and February of this year seems like 10 years ago, because so many things have changed in everyone's lives. But it's really changed in marketing, and especially for marketing for financial advisors. So talk to us about that a little bit more. Like, let's just 
kind of dive into that discussion. I think it's it's top of mind for most of us these days. I I, I mean, I kind of feel like this this went in phases. You know, phase one was sort of March, April, May, and just markets were going crazy volatile. There was so much uncertainty in the environment. I feel like for most of us, it was really just a all hands on deck, like keep clients on board, make sure there's there, no one's doing any bad panic selling, like just survive and get through. Then we kind of got into the summer, which I, I think for a lot of us is a little bit of a lull anyways. A business tends to slow down. A lot of people, well, at least used to be on vacations, but we didn't tend to have as intensive meetings and it wasn't always an intensive business development time. And then just over the past two or three months, like we got into the fall this thing's clearly still hanging around for a while, right? Because you know, in March it was supposed to be gone by September. Now it's September; it's clearly still here. I can tell because my kids are doing school in the kitchen downstairs. <laughs> and and now we're in the like, okay, this is here for a while. I'm not getting back to my old marketing strategies anytime soon. I got to figure out how where growth is going to come from because I still got to get some level of growth to move forward. Oh, geez, I guess now is the time to really start thinking about completely reinventing my marketing. Yes. And, and I think that the, the first initial thought was, this is going to go away and I'm going to be able to go back to normal. So I'm not going to do anything right now. I'm not going to make any really quick changes right now. But by the time we got to May at Red Zone Marketing, we did a survey of financial advisors. And we wanted to know, hey, are, are you going back to the office? Are you not going to the office? Are you meeting with clients? Are you doing, you know, what are you doing with your marketing and what's actually working? And are you getting support from your broker dealer? Are you getting support from firm of affiliation? Are, are you getting support from your wholesalers? And so we wanted to know all those questions. And in May, we did the survey and it was like, hey, we're going to be back in the office pretty soon. And that was, if we're not in the office now, we're going to be back in the office pretty soon. Then we did the survey in June and then it, you know, we saw, okay, well, maybe it's not what we thought it was going to be. And maybe we have to start getting into, and we saw, saw more and more marketing strategies that were coming about that we were collecting in the survey that were, were actually working for advisors. And then we did the survey in September. And that's when we really started to figure out if you're bringing on new clients, exactly how are you doing it? What are the strategies? And then we dug deeper into it and did some qualitative research too, to find out, okay, if you're doing virtual educational seminars, what are you doing? What's the topic? Who are you using? You know, how is that working? Because we wanted to make sure that we weren't just looking at our own clients that are financial advisors, but looking across the industry. And, you know, in the very beginning, I, I think advisors just thought that this was, you know, just going to go away. Hardly any advisors had any kind of a plan for returning to the office. And then, they realized, okay, we probably need a plan. We probably need a plan to announce to our clients because if they're going to come back in, they're, they're going to want to know about safety. And so all of these things happen. But the most interesting thing for me, of course, in doing this survey was what are the marketing strategies that are working right now? And I, I'm also interested in what are the strategies that you're using, but I'm much more interested in what's actually producing new clients. And those are actually, there's different answers to those. So, but we found some really interesting things and it has not been easy for financial advisors. That is for sure. When you're used to meeting with your clients face-to-face -face and getting referrals because you have all that face-to-face -face time with them and they love you, it's just not happening in exactly the same way. And so can you just share some with us? Like what, what what are you finding in your research? Like what are advisors doing that is actually working for marketing and growth in this environment where a lot of the old stuff seems to not work or certainly not work the way that we used to do it? Right. So there are four main, if we look at the top four things that advisors are doing right now that are actually bringing on new clients, it's as expected referrals without asking because we wanted to separate, are you asking for referrals? Or are you getting them just because you're doing a good job? So referrals without asking has always been at the top of the list, still is asking specific strategies for asking for referrals from clients and strategic alliances is number two, followed very closely by email campaigns, specific email campaigns to clients and prospects. And then virtual educational seminars is something, you know, kind of brand new and rounding up number four. There's a whole bunch of other strategies that are producing new clients, but those are the main, if we, if we segment off from the, the whole population of the advisors that we surveyed, 
When we segment off at the advisors who are bringing in more new clients than others, they are doing not only the virtual educational seminars, but virtual client appreciation events. They are doing, you know, Facebook prospecting, social media advertising, LinkedIn prospecting, Google AdWords, and, and you know, all the things that uh, a lot of advisors will say, well, I'm not sure that all that, you know, digital marketing is really going to work, but this content marketing and digital marketing is starting to have success. And I think the reason that it's starting to have more success and bring in more clients is because advisors are doing it more. And I think the more we do it, the more we're going to find out that that's actually going to bring on new clients. And we don't have as many restrictions with social media that prevents us from doing these things. I think part of it is we think we have all these restrictions and depend on what firm you're at, you probably have, you know, some, you know, restrictions, but it's very possible and it's really starting to work in terms of bringing on new clients. And so we're seeing that, but the virtual educational seminars and the virtual client appreciation events are really an interesting topic because that's something that no one really, for the most part, had done before. And now there, you know, there's all sorts of evidence that it's actually working to number one, get more referrals and number two, you know, get more clients. So that's all good. So help me understand a little bit further how each of these buckets are, are, are being done. I guess I want to start with, we'll call it the more traditional ones first, you know, as you noted, like number one was for growth was just getting the referrals. You don't even ask for, they just, Come because you're doing a good job, and certain clients refer you for that stuff. God, you know, bless their souls. And and you know, we did a we did an advisor marketing study earlier this year as well. And we were actually pulling. We were mostly surveying advisors into last year, so we'll call it pre pandemic surveying. But but similarly found from our research, like just the raw numbers are 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 pretty straightforward. Client referrals are just still an absolutely phenomenally efficient strategy, if only because you know, it's a very relationship-based strategy, which is actually time intensive. But you had to do that just to keep the clients anyway. So like at the margin, right. the only work is essentially, hey, I'm sending Jim your way. Can you take the call? Like, yeah, we'll take that call. And it, and it just doesn't take much work at the margin to, to field inbound referrals. They just kind of show up with new revenue. So so we've seen that as well. Is there anything specific that you're you're seeing or finding in in pandemic environment and current environment about like why some advisors seem to have a lot of success getting referrals without even asking and others like I feel like I'm doing good work. Ain't no rain falling from the sky for me. <laughs> right. Is there is there something that that defines or delineates that you're able to tell like who's actually getting referrals without even asking and what what differentiates them from the rest? Yeah, from the research, we drew the conclusion that the advisors in general are communicating more with their clients this year than they did last year. And for a variety of different reasons, they're doing that. But the advisors who are having different kinds of communication like Zoom or WebEx with the face-to-face -face, and they're getting that face-to-face -face meeting down with their clients are finding that it's a much better connection for the referrals and for the other things than just having that regular phone call in the midst of this is, I don't know that there's ever been a time when financial advisors were needed more than they're needed now because there's just so much uncertainty and people are like, should I retire? What should I do? You know, do I have enough money? I, I don't want to lose any money. And advisors have been communicating a lot. The level to which you communicate, though, makes an actual difference related to referrals. Now, not every single client is going to refer you, but your best clients, the more you have connection with them, and face-to-face, -face, meaning face-to-face -face video, the better off you're going to be in terms of gathering of those referrals. It actually really matters. So uh, some advisors don't feel comfortable. That means not just sending out, I, I guess, mass emails to clients or even individual email updates to clients, but specifically the, hey, Jim, it would be great to, to check in with you. Can we hop onto a Zoom call next week at two o'clock for a little while? I just want to connect with you and see how it's going, if there's anything we can do to help. That is exactly, exactly. And especially when the market goes down, maybe it goes down one day, then it goes down another day. And then now the clients, maybe they're not calling, but maybe you know, I should reach out to them and we should just connect. Even just for 15 minutes, 
making that appointment to have that face to face. Because if I see your face and you're, you're looking like you're p- pretty confident in what's happening here, I'm going to be more confident as the investor and it makes a big difference. So that somehow getting that face to face feeling makes a big difference. And, you know, we knew that that was the truth back when, you know, how many times are you meeting face to face with your clients to do a, a client review or, you know, whatever that might be. And, the advisors that are meeting one time a year face to face, we're having some in not all cases, it's not a total generalization, but we're having less success than those that had more connection with their clients. And that connection could be through client appreciation events and other things that are happening. But how do you get that feeling and get them thinking about you so that they go out and refer you to others? So it does matter. I feel like there's a lot of advisors that would, uh, I was going to say argue, maybe argue is not the right word, but just like would would make the case that it, it's just not the same doing it virtually. Like it's not the same face-to-face connection virtually than you know than it was in person or or will be again at some point whenever we're allowed to get get back together in person. So, would your response be like, are, are like, are we underestimating how good the face-to-face actually is in virtual, or is it just, yeah, it's lesser, but hey, we can't do anything else anyway, so it's still better than nothing. Like, how do we compare? face-to-face virtual versus face-to-face person in in person. Yeah, face-to-face in person, there's there's nothing that that beats that because you get the nonverbal communication, you get all of the things that happen when you're face to face. When you're doing a virtual meeting, the meetings are typically much shorter, you know, they're more concise. There's a lot of there, there's a whole bunch of differences and we've done a bunch of research on that too, like what actually makes a good virtual prospect meeting or a good virtual client meeting. But but here's the thing, having a phone call with the client or having a Zoom call with a client, which is going to help you be more connected. And it's going to be the Zoom call. So it's not the best, but it's better than the regular phone call. And it's certainly better than the bulk emails that go out saying this is what the market's doing this week. So it it is it is better than anything else that we can do in the midst of a pandemic. I mean, it's it's that face-to-face meeting, but it's also some of the fun things that advisors are doing with virtual client appreciation events and things like that. But but if you're comparing face-to-face with virtual, face-to-face is always better, but that virtual video meeting is better than a phone call. So you've got levels and we're sort of added a level because most advisors didn't do Zoom calls with their clients. They would do a phone call, maybe a phone review, and then they would do a face-to-face review. The Zoom is much more connected than just the regular phone call. And so how do I handle that for my clients that aren't cooperating with video in the first place, right? I, you know, sometimes it's, it's kind of, it's us, right? Like, I'm not so comfortable with Zoom and this video thing. And like, I'd rather just call my clients, but sometimes it's, it's the client like, Hey, Bob, I'd love to catch up with you on a Zoom call. It's like, sure. Call me at my phone number. <laughs> right. You're actually kind of assessing a Zoom call, but sure i'll phone call call you instead i guess like do we just have to meet clients where they are like push for them to meet with you by video but if they don't take the phone call because it's still better than nothing well yes and also i know advisors who have had some pushback from their clients like you know can't we just do a call well i'd like to share my screen and i'd like to talk about what's actually happening right now I want to show you some graphs. I want to show you your own accounts. I want to go through this with you. And so sometimes it starts with the shared screen and then moves into video. But you have to have a reason. And that's a really good reason. I I just want to show some stuff. I like that. So so it's not like, I I just want to see your smiling face. (laughs) Can we turn on the video? Like, we don't have to go that route. Well, you know, I want to to screen share some things about what's going on in your accounts or what's going on with your financial plan just would be easier to share that information if I could turn it on for a screen share would you know would it be okay if we did this via zoom just so I could share more information with you and make it a more productive conversation right yep it's hard hard to say no to that right it's because it just it makes sense oh yeah I want to see what's going on with my financial plan or my accounts okay that sounds good and it's also like zoom now some advisors can't use zoom but for the most part, Zoom is super easy. I mean, my parents are almost in their 80s and they're able to get on with no problem to Zoom. So, and I'm telling you, sometimes the iPad doesn't work very well, but they have no problem getting on Zoom on their computer. So 
I think there's less excuses from the clients. I think it's more of what you said before. Now, I don't know this for a fact because we didn't survey on this, but you know, it, it's easier for the advisor just to hop on the phone. If I've got to figure out what's going on in my background and I've got to maybe have some things to share via screenshots and things like that, well, then I have to be more prepared and it's easier just to do a phone call. And it's not that a phone call is not good. It's just there's levels. You know, one of the interesting points that I think comes up as well, you know, as you noted, like virtual meetings tend to be a little bit shorter, a little bit more concise, you know, just the, the conversations don't run as long. I mean, I, I found this even when we were starting to do more virtual meetings with some clients eight, 10 years ago, like in the early 2010s, when just Zoom and go to meeting and the rest were, were getting pretty functional, that the meetings just tend to be shorter. They tend to wrap up more quickly. On the one end, that's, you know, kind of feels like less connection with the, with the client. Like just, we don't, we don't chit chat as much. We don't get quite as much into things and, uh, as we do when they're in the office. But the flip side is it means you can check in more. Yes. You can just do it more often. And, uh, you know, one of the things that has long struck me about this, this shift, you know, we still only have so many hours through the year that we can spend per client or connect with each client, but you know, if you just envision a world where instead of having one or two meetings that are an hour or two each, you have your quarterly check-ins that are 20 or 30 minutes each, it may still be the same amount of total meeting time for the year that you're going back and forth with clients. But I can pretty much guarantee you that if you're talking to your clients four to six times a year, you're going to end up having a better connection to them than if you only talk to them once or twice a year. Yeah, absolutely. We just literally like stay more connected and involved in their lives and what's going on and have more opportunities to give advice if we're just literally communicating and interacting with them more often. And to me, that that's one of the cool opportunities that comes from a shift to, to digital communication or a force shift to digital communication. I mean, yeah, it may still be nice to get back to at least one lengthier in-person meeting per year when, when we can do that again. But, you know, just if this gets us to a world where Clients we talk to once a year or two to three times a year and clients we used to talk to twice a year, or four to six times a year and clients we used to talk to quarterly now get monthly check-ins because those are basically all the same time, just broken up into smaller bites, higher frequency with smaller bites to maintain a more continuous connection. Like I'd, I'd bet my money on that for depth of connection and, and, and ultimately the amount of referrals that you get from that. I bet on that without hesitation. Yeah, absolutely. But there's another thing too, in some of the large urban areas, clients didn't want to come to the office because it would take forever to drive, you know, through LA or San Francisco. Yeah, or, we're we're the, we're in the DC area here. Our traffic is awful. I mean, the joke yeah. is like the meeting has to be more than thirty minutes because that's how long it takes for the road rage to wear off. Just so you can, <laughs> just so you can calm down for the frustration of having been in DC traffic and actually focus on whatever it is you were meeting for. Yes, I used to live there, and I I do recall. I do recall very much. But so that's a that's another positive is. You know, clients didn't want to come to a client appreciation event. Clients didn't want to come in for a meeting. Can we just do it over the phone? There's a better way to do it now. I mean, this way has been available, but a lot of advisors just didn't do that. And now they've got the opportunity to establish better connections with some of their clients, especially, like I say, in those urban areas. And and by the way, the, our, our studies have shown that the urban areas are going to go back to the office full time the last, you know, rural areas are going back already and suburban areas going back to the office already. But, but the urban areas, they're like, it's not going to be till next year sometime. So it's just a way to connect. And I think that it's something that advisors should take advantage of. But we also know from our study that it's not, it's not necessarily easy for advisors. And, and one of the things that we found when we did the study in May and when we did the study in June, we saw that advisors were increasing their confidence in doing virtual prospecting meetings, specifically virtual prospecting meetings. And as more and more advisors started doing virtual prospect meetings, we actually saw in September that their confidence was going down as to how those prospect meetings were actually like, can I actually make this successful? The more they were doing it, the more they were saying, wait a minute, because you do it once and you go, that didn't go very well. 
So then you do it 10 times and it's like, all oh, right, maybe I'm actually not very good at this. <laughs> well, that, that could be in some cases, but I think that <laughs> it's just getting it down. It's just figuring it out. Like the first time you did a face-to-face meeting with the client, it probably wasn't, you know, that easy either. And now you're, you're just doing these meetings differently and it just requires practice and like, what am I supposed to look at on the screen? What's behind me? How do I share things? You know, just getting it down takes a few tries. But we realized that advisors were losing their confidence in this particular area as they did more. And I think that if we do the survey again, we'll see that the confidence will go up. But that's that was something that actually surprised me because I thought that it would just continue to go up and up and up, and it has not. So so you would notice as well, like there are dynamics of, well, I guess, like what you're finding that makes a particularly good virtual prospect or virtual client meeting. Like what, what does it look like when this actually goes well? So what what are you finding that's, I guess, more more unique or more specific about what actually makes a good virtual client or virtual prospect meeting versus, I guess, what, what the rest of us are doing that maybe is more difficult or, or struggling? Yeah. So in, in our research on this, we you know, talk to a lot of different advisors and what are you doing and how's it working? Again, digging deeper to figure out, okay, so how is this really working or not working for you? And we actually, I, I just recently wrote a whole sort of white paper on virtual prospecting. What are the strategies for closing more meetings? And the number one thing that we found was that you need to prepare differently for a virtual meeting. And that's the first mistake that you make if you don't, you know, have that preparation. Like, and preparation is everything from maybe an, a different kind of an agenda. What's different in, in practice? Like what actually is changing in virtual meeting from what we may have done in person? Yeah. So one thing is there just needs to be more prep with, number one, setting the expectations for the prospect or the client. So what's going to happen? How long is this going to take? What is this going to be? Because they've not done it either, right? Scheduling tools have really helped to get this down to, you know, like Calendly or whatever that is, but having an agenda and sharing the agenda prior to the meeting has also been, so people feel like they're more, they don't know what they're going into. They feel as uncomfortable perhaps as the advisor does, right? And then preparing for a shorter meeting. And when we looked at, well, how short should the meeting be? It's probably three quarters to half the length of a normal in-person meeting. So if you're usually meeting for an hour, it's just going to be less than that. And because people have less attention span. It's just not as comfortable like sitting back in a chair and drinking a cup of coffee while talking to somebody. It's totally different when you're just staring into the, you know, the the computer screen. The other thing is creating visuals. And the thing that we found is that you actually need more visuals when you're doing a virtual meeting than if you're just doing a regular meeting because you want to keep people's attention. So, you know, what's the purpose of this meeting? It depends if you're meeting with a prospect or a client, but having all of those things laid out in five to 10 slides or whatever it might be that you're going to go over, but having those visuals created in advance is something that you need to do. And, and finally it's, it's practicing, practicing, like doing a run through a mock meeting where you test out the technology. Like I did this morning with Jim in your office, right? And we we tested this out to make sure that it's working and to, to figure all of that stuff out, but testing it out to see, okay, well, what did I look like when I was going through those slides? Or how quickly was I doing that? Or what is my background? What is that thing back there? I got to move that. You know, so it's all of those things that are really important for preparing for that really good meeting. And that's different. It's a different level of preparation. Now, I know advisors prepare a lot for their, you know, client review meetings and things like that. But it's just a little different when you've got to present it all on the screen. You know, I think it's an interesting framing of, of sort of bringing more prep materials with you. And 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 part of me then is just listening to this of like, so basically all that time savings I was going to have by having shorter meetings, I'm going to lose by having more prep time and making agendas and sharing agendas and 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 making more visuals for my meetings. On the flip side though, you know, one of the themes that we've been talking about more more recently on the blog as well are, are advisors that do meeting surges. Where you do like clusters of of yeah. meetings, you know, do do all your you know do all your fall client review meetings in a big cluster in November and December, where you do like three, four, five meetings a day for the span of six weeks, get through all the core clients that you needed to to meet with in an intensive sprint, and then you're and then you're kind of done for a 
a month or two because you just went through the whole client base in, in meeting with them. And that one of the upsides of doing that as well, aside from just there's sort of some business efficiency of just getting focused sprints or, or, or focused surges of meetings is that, you know, if, like if I'm going to be doing end of year planning and I'm going to be talking about what's going on in the portfolio or what's going on in the markets or what's going on with the election and your tax planning or whatever it is that's kind of your theme to the meeting, if you cluster your meetings together, you know, one standardized agenda and one sort of standardized set of slides of the, the the talking point, the story, the thing that we're focusing on right now, I, I might just have to make that once and adapt it very slightly for each client. And I can really get some efficiency and leverage out of the meeting, the material that I prepared for the meeting, rather than needing to go like new, new prep materials for every client meeting one at a time, which becomes really, really time consuming. Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of this is repeatable. You know, when you're meeting with a prospect, do you have a five slide capabilities deck that just shares a little bit about who you are? Because you're going to talk about it when it's your turn to talk about your firm and what you do. But having those that capabilities deck, that's not going to change. I mean, you're you're not going to change that every single time you talk to a client. Right. Now, when you're dealing or a prospect rather, but when you're dealing with a client, you know, you got to give them some of their own individual material, obviously, but I think much of it is repeatable and, you know, you get the, you get most of it down and then you're just tweaking, like you said, and that's exactly, that's exactly what happens. Cause I, I was kind of thinking in my head of around just ongoing cadence of client meetings where there's stuff that's at least a little more client specific. How are they doing with their plan? What's going on with their portfolio, et cetera. But particularly in the context of a prospect meeting, like the pitch from our firm, like the standard stuff that we're doing from our firms. And yeah, that's mostly templated and consistent every client conversation. Like, yeah, there'll be some point where we get to the proposal part of like, here's literally what we're going to do for you based on your information, which gets a little bit more specific. But the story of how that we tell of our firm and our value is often already create, put into physical marketing materials, a pitch book, whatever it is that you want to call your support marketing collateral. So just make sure you have digitized electronic versions of it so you're still doing that same conversation virtually. And if you maybe didn't make a physical one of those before, really good to look at actually doing that now. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that advisors have recognized that they need to have is, you know, that capabilities deck or pitch deck. Or I like to call it a capabilities deck rather than a pitch deck, but it's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a much nicer label. I like yours better. Well, it's more about the value proposition, right? It's yes. not about, I'm trying to sell you something. Here's the pitch, you know, that's yep. the old insurance days, I think. So we've, we've tried to kind of change that a little bit, but so the capabilities deck, but also what's your online presence look like? Because you know that before somebody is going to meet with you online or even decide that they're going to meet with you, uh, they're going to Google you. And for prospects, they're going to Google you. They're going to look at you. They're going to look at your LinkedIn profile. They're going to look at your website and they're going to make a decision about whether or not to have that call or whether or not to be excited about this meeting they've got coming up. There's a lot of perception that happens with your online reputation and advisors are working on fixing that as well. And I think during a pandemic, what there's no better time than to improve your online reputation. So that's kind of the whole domain of how advisors are driving more referrals without even asking, without without even asking for referrals, kind of client service, which these days is translating heavily into frequency of communication, depth of communication, connection on the communication for which maybe Zoom video isn't ideal, but it's way better than emails and phone calls for the actual personal connection part. So I kind of, I get that box. The second one that you had said was, those who are asking for referrals, either from clients or from strategic alliances. So can you talk to us a little bit more about what what that looks like in a in a pandemic environment? Like what what works in asking for referrals when, you know, I think a lot of us at the end of the day would tend to ask for referrals at at the end of a client review meeting over lunch with a center of influence strategic alliance we're working on. You know, the, the client meeting is now virtual. Maybe asking for referrals doesn't feel as as good or quite the same. Can't do lunch with my CPAs and attorneys right now. So like how is asking for referrals working in a pandemic environment from from what you're seeing in your research? 
Yeah. Well, the first thing that you need to do and what we've seen advisors, you know, that they're doing this is that they're actually decided that they're going to make an active commitment to asking for referrals. The problem with asking for referrals is that most advisors don't want to do it. It feels uncomfortable to everybody. It's just, it's not great. But today, right now, when there's so much uncertainty going on in the world, but like I said before, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be a financial advisor. What if you weren't asking for referrals necessarily, but you were that you were committed in purpose to help others? And if that was the true commitment, was my purpose here, the reason I'm a financial advisor is to help others. And if you know someone who you know might need a, a second opinion, and actually, you know, it's funny because second opinion language for referrals has been around forever. We see it work incredibly right now. Like, I mean, really work right now. But you have to have that commitment to actually having that conversation. And it's much easier to have that conversation when it's second opinion focused than it is when you're just saying, do you know anyone who might have interest in doing business with a firm like mine? It's like, nope, I don't know anybody. (laughs) So this would be more of, you know, if there are any friends and family that you have that maybe aren't as happy with their current advisor or don't feel that you know, they're having the connection with them that that we have here. You know, we do offer a second opinion service where we're happy to just review their information at, at, with no commitment and just share some thoughts and ideas and see if it might be a good fit. So, you know, we'd be happy to to meet with any folks that you know that would like a second opinion in an environment like this. Right. So here, here's an example. You know, I know there's a lot of executives like you who are navigating their finances, investments, benefits, and future during these uncertain times. If you know someone who could use some guidance or even a second opinion, let me know. That's why I became a financial advisor, to help, to really help people get their finances in order. But then the key thing that we've seen with the number of referrals at particular firms is when they actually, you know, I said actively taking control of this referral, the referral conversation, but also, would you mind if I sent a brief email introduction and CC'd you? If they come up with someone, instead of saying, well, you know, sure, great, but actually having an email template that says exactly what you want to share to that person, you CC the client, you send it to the prospect, you've got your system down. And the more you do that, the more referrals will come in. It's just, that's just natural. I mean, one of the things that we always say to advisors is you can control fixed activity, but you can't control the variable outcome, especially with referrals, especially if you do enough of this fixed activity, we can actually turn it so you can predict the variable outcome. So you can do fixed activity. If I do this, then this happens. But you know, with referrals, the, you can have all these conversations and it's not going to turn into, it's not a one-to-one situation. But if you ask enough times, if you have a conversation now, what we've seen works, and this is sometimes advisors go, what? Five times a day having a conversation with somebody, not specifically calling them with a second opinion script, but having a conversation with somebody that you're already talking to five times a day you can predict the variable outcome based on how many referrals you're you're getting in at this point right now. We know that it can be even more successful, and so we've we've tracked with advisors. That means doing five proactive, like existing client outreaches. Hey, I just want to check in, and if the conversation flows appropriately, I'll mention this second opinion conversation. Right. Or talking to a CPA or talking to somebody just, you know, in the course of doing business, then saying that. Now, the other thing is, is just sending an email to clients or maybe putting it in as part of an email that goes to clients with some second opinion language. You know, if you sense that any family members, friends, colleagues are all unsettled with this market volatility, I'd be happy to have a chat with them. You know, so it's, it's just getting that conversation down so you can slip it in your email, your phone conversation with your CPA that, you know, you're trying to get referrals from and all of that. It's just a very purposed way of doing it. And we've seen more success doing this than in any other referral strategy. And it's partly because of the time that we're in. People can have that conversation with their friend and neighbor. It's not like, hey, the market's going straight up. Do you want to go talk to my financial advisor? It's not that way. And it's easier to have that conversation for clients about their financial advisor today. And is this substantively the same conversation depending on whether it's asking for a referral from a client or asking for a referral from a strategic alliance? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's essentially the same what I've seen because I don't just assume that this is what advisors are saying. We're actually asking them for the scripts and we've got a collection of them that are actually working. So I haven't seen any difference between, you know, between CPAs and, and just the regular clients. I suppose there'd be some tweaking. But the, the other thing that we've seen that really works is we have an advisor that, and she sent me this, she sent it to her clients and it was almost like a, it looked like a postcard, but it was in a constant contact email. And it re- basically talks about free planning services for executives facing furloughs, layoffs, pay reduction, and retirement postponed. It's a second opinion, kind of a, a conversation, but she works with executives. And so she sent this message out to her executive clients. If you know other executives who are facing these situations, have them give me a call. No obligation. I just want to help. I, I, I need to help right now. That's the, I, that's my way of giving back. So she has gotten three new clients already from doing this because just because the executive got furloughed doesn't mean they don't have stock options or whatever else they might have going on. And so it has been super successful for her. So the third area that you talked about of what firms are doing that's working for them now is email campaigns. Yes. So can you talk more about like, what does that mean for email campaigns? Is this uh, like sending checking emails to clients? Is this sending out market commentary to, to talk through the market volatility? Is, is this something else? Like what's, what's working? What's the driver here when it comes to email campaigns? Yeah. So there's three types of email campaigns that we identified. The first one is targeted emails to segmented lists. So for instance, you know, you, you've got physicians and the subject line for your physician email says a new protection strategy for physicians. And it talks about the volatility in the market and the uncertainty in the healthcare field and all of that. But that's just one example, but it's a targeted email to a segmented list. Now, the questions that usually people ask after that is, well, where do you get the list? (laughs) And so sometimes advisors are collecting and and amassing a list by asking their clients or just having prospects. If they did prospecting before, they might have a list. But you can also buy lists. And there's different services where you can buy lists from of really targeted, specific types of people. Now, physicians in particular, some advisors like to target physicians, but physicians aren't hanging out on LinkedIn or Facebook. So you don't have a lot of ways to contact them. What are the best ways to reach them? Email happens to be. But it's also the same for other really targeted, segmented groups of, of the population. Let me ask just one other, one other quick question on that. Going further into this, how do you build the list? You'd mentioned like there are there are list providers out there. Can you just for firms that have never done this and don't even know where to look, like who are the providers that do this? Are there at least some larger ones or common ones that you tend to see that get used in this context? Yeah. So there's one, it's data axle USA. So it used to be Info USA, and now it's D A T A A X L E USA dot com, and you can parse out lists for both mailing and emailing. They've got access to just about everything. So that's a place that we use if you don't have your own list. And there's others that are like that, but that's one that we found the lists are pretty accurate. So I mean, you're you're not going to get a hundred percent accurate. And so I'd be buying, like I'd essentially be buying an email list that I can then start sending my emails to and trying to get a message that resonates with them. So it could be could be buying a list, it could be renting a list, but yes, that's typically how it works. So how do those how do those economics typically work? Like just I've no context. Is this like it's going to cost me ten thousand dollars to get a list? It's going to cost me two thousand dollars to get a list. Like is my List going to have a hundred thousand names, and maybe two percent of them will actually ever see anything. Or like, am I going to end up with two thousand names, but it's actually going to have a really high connection rate if I can make a good subject line? Like, what what should I expect in terms of of cost and reach if I start going down this road as a firm? Yeah, I mean, I would expect to spend a couple thousand dollars probably, but it depends. Like, let's say you want to market to physicians in the United States, or you want to market to physicians in the DC, Virginia, Maryland area. That's very different, right? 
So if I if I make my list a little narrower and more targeted in the first place, which I may just want to do because I want to get people locally, that brings down my cost because I may bring down my cost and will bring down how many I reach, I guess. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So it it depends on the harder it is to reach particular individuals, the more expensive that list will be. So the easier it is to access people, it'll cost less. But with this Data Axel USA, you can actually go in and do a search and figure out how much it would cost. And you can just do that all online. So it makes it really easy to kind of just play around. And So like I, I set my parameters. Obviously, I guess they're not going to literally give me the, the names because then I wouldn't have to pay for them. But <laughs> right. I, I can say like, I want physicians in the D.C. metro area across these three counties that are close into the city because that's near where our office is. And they might say, like, you know, we have 1,722 people on our list who match that criteria. And here's how much it'll cost you to get that list of email addresses and start sending stuff to them. Yep, that's exactly right. Now, the other way to build lists is by using content marketing, which is, you know, you're putting information out. Now, with physicians, it doesn't necessarily work that well, but you put information out into the, you know, social media, digital world, and you're trying to get people to come back to your website to download the 10 things you need to know, you know, before you retire or whatever that, whatever that call to action is. And as they click on that, you ask for their email and, you know, perhaps, you know, you can keep track of, hey, who is, if they're clicking on this particular article, they're probably interested in this. So let's put them on this list. And then all of a sudden you're creating your own lists. And that whole content marketing strategy is something that there are firms out there that help to do that. There's firms like Snappy Kraken and Lead Pilot that will help you with those, in addition to just doing it yourself, but that will help you with pulling those prospects into you and collecting your own lists by putting content that out there that's interesting to people. And so the, I guess the challenge on my end is as an advisor is then I got to figure out how to get the content out there so people will find my website to sign up for my stuff in the first place. And I got to make some content so that there are things to put in this email campaign to set out there. Right. And so the, the two companies that I just mentioned, Lead Pilot and Snappy Kraken, they have content. They have campaigns that you can plug into. So it makes it a little bit easier. Now, we also write custom campaigns for, for people, but for advisors, but it's easier if somebody's already done the work for you and you just sort of grab into it. But they have campaigns for specific target markets, both of those providers do. And so I mentioned that because, you know, if you're looking for that, I want to do this, but I don't know how to create this content. I don't know how to get this content out there. And I don't have the time to spend to figure it out. There are companies that have already done that. And you can plug into their systems and they're not very expensive either. I mean, comparatively. And so as I'm doing this, like what... I mean, I get some of these services well, may have some content that's created to help me get there. But like, what am I sending people? Like, am I sending market commentary and investment kind of discussion? Like, you know, here's our view on the markets. If you want us to help you with your portfolio, please click the link below to schedule a meeting. Like, am I saying that kind of stuff? Or what am I sending that's that's actually working in this environment? Yeah, it's more... Actually, let me pull up a few... Here's some subject lines that advisors have used on their email campaigns, and I think this will help with that content question. So in the subject line, case study on protecting your money in retirement. That's the subject line. So obviously the content is about what you can do to protect your money in retirement. And then you might have a call to action at the end of that that would drive people back to your website so that they can click or a landing page so that they can click on that download our report to find out more in detail of the things that you can do step by step or whatever that is. Another one is, isn't it time to actually protect your investments? And so obviously the protection is a big topic right now because people are freaking out about the, the volatility of the market and everything else. But there could be other things that are more lifestyle, like the 10 best places to retire on a budget or you know, something like that. So interesting topics. That is the key. I would assume for a lot of people that the market commentary isn't as interesting as some of these other things are. So 
you've got to look at it from a marketing perspective. You're going to send your clients market updates and all of that. But for prospects, that may not get them to open the email and take a look at it. So we have to look at what is interesting. And I think that's the, that's really the key. And that actually draws into the second kind of email that advisors are sending out right now. And it's that email newsletter with interesting content to clients and prospects. Now, why does that produce new clients? Well, People are forwarding it on. You're sending it to prospects. It's interesting. You're staying in front of them and you're sort of building them into this funnel that you have, which is I got their name. I am now trying to build awareness and consideration and just in a very thoughtful way, pulling them into a funnel where they're going to make a decision that maybe they want to come in and see us because we're putting good, valuable content out there that's helpful. So the the fourth category you had mentioned is virtual educational seminars. So I guess this is, you know, our, our, our digitally adapted version of, I was going to call it good old fashioned in-person seminar marketing done in the virtual context. So what, like, what are firms doing when it comes to virtual educational seminars that's, that's driving marketing results? Yeah. So there, I mean, there are companies out there that help with this particular strategy to drive people that maybe you don't have on your list to come to a, you know, protecting your investments in volatile markets webinar or whatever it is. But there's a few companies like Leading Response, which is a company down in Tampa, Florida. And then White Glove is another one where they're actually helping you drive and collect from their strategies to find people online who might be interested in this kind of a topic and driving them into register for your event. But So these, these firms, uh, Leading Response, White Glove, will do the marketing for me. So I, I just... I just have to have my expert presentation, whatever it was that maybe I used to do as an in-person seminar event already. You know, I go and say, I've got a webinar on this. Can you help me get some virtual prospects to show up for this thing? And then they'll go and help execute that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And the other thing that we found is that because of that whole second opinion thing we were talking about before, you know, you've got an educational event, your clients maybe aren't going to attend because they're already, you know, they, they've already gotten some of this stuff figured out through, you know, your great advice and all of that. So, but why would we send it to our clients? Because you ask them, hey, if you know someone who'd like to attend this and referrals for educational events have also been something that's very successful. So, you know, you're not going to get as many people on a virtual call as you will, at least that's what we've seen, as you will in a in person when you're giving them dinner and everything else. But we've seen that the closing ratio is much higher on a webinar because they're not coming for the dinner. They're not coming for all of the, well, I really want to go to that country club or that steak restaurant or whatever. They're actually coming because they want the information and it's not a bait and switch. It's just, they want the information. And so we've seen the closing rates to be higher than in those larger dinner seminars and the cost is much less. And so what, I I mean, just what do firms do in practice? Is this just literally like, I'm going to run a webinar. So I I buy a Zoom subscription, send invitations out to this event. Hopefully some people show up and then just like screen share my PowerPoint and talk. And, and that's the deal. Well, in, in very simplistic ways, that is that is the deal. But there's a lot of things that need to go into how do you conduct a good video meeting like that because you won't use your same exact slides as you did before. And the reason for that is, is because you're going to want to use more slides than you did when you're in an in-person meeting because you're in you're an in-person meeting, you might have one slide up and you're walking around and you're talking about that one slide for a while. That is not the way to do a virtual educational seminar because you're going to lose them. You've got to have lots of things changing, interaction, polls, you know, all those kinds of things. Now, how do you figure out how to do that? Well, you know, if, if you go, I, I'm just not confident in doing all of this, you can hire somebody to help you. You can hire a firm like White Glove who will give you all the tools you need. There are firms that will do this for you in and we, like I said, we've seen higher rates of closing in these than in the those other, you know, kind of standard dinner seminars. So few fewer people come, but 
you 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 only show up for an online webinar because you actually want the information. So they right. they will tend to be more qualified prospects and therefore maybe more more likely to actually close and follow through because you're not filtering through extra people who came but weren't really actually seriously looking at working with you. They just, as you said, wanted the dinner or a peek at that country club. That's exactly right. Yep. And so for firms that are doing this, just again, I guess I'm just trying to understand like what are my what are my expectations? Like, what is it? You know, you had noted it's cheaper to to do events online because you know we don't have the space rentals and food and catering and a lot of other ancillary costs. But but I still got to build my list or get my list or buy my list and may have to buy a presentation if I'm not so PowerPoint inclined in the first place. Like, what is it? You know, what does it cost a firm to do this? What should I and and what should I expect out of it? So, as an example, with white glove, they do not charge unless somebody actually shows up on the webinar. So it's an interesting model of, you know, sort of only pay if somebody shows up kind of a model and then you pay per person and it's several hundred dollars per person that you pay when they actually come to the event. So if you get 30 people that come to the event, you know, then, you know, you're going to pay whatever that is. But if you get zero people to come to the event, it's totally free. And now we don't want zero people to come, but we also don't want to pay if zero people are going to come. And so that's kind of a, it's, it's a pretty good strategy, but we have advisors that aren't using other services. They're doing this on their own and it literally is not costing really anything. I mean, you have to have your subscription to whatever service you're going to use, WebEx or Zoom or whatever it is, but it doesn't really cost that much. If you've got an email list, you've got clients who are willing to refer and you don't care if you have 10 or 15 people on this, you don't need to have 50 people to make this successful. Just a few units, as they say, you know, can make a a really successful event. I've had an advisor who did it when one person showed up and he closed that one person. So, well, they got, they got very specialized attention. (laughs) That's exactly right. It doesn't matter. It's a meeting and it's really not costing you very much. So, there's a lot less stress. I know a lot of advisors, you know, were back in the days of dinner seminars, you know, spending seven, ten thousand dollars to do a, a series of dinner seminars. Well, you know, that's an out that's a pretty large outlay of cash. But for these virtual, you you know, you have some risk, but you don't have nearly that kind of a risk. Well, and I guess that makes the interesting point well of you know, there's there's sort of things you do in the short term for marketing, just like let's let's run an event, let's do a referral campaign, whatever it is, because we're trying to move the needle. Then there's also some of the stuff that you do that that builds a little bit more for the long term. You know, to me, this, I mean, this sort of highlights that there's, there's basically three pieces of what you've got to, what you've got to do and pay for. You, you, you need some system to run the webinar, you need to create the presentation, and you need to be able to get people to show up. And so the run the system part is actually rather inexpensive, because just web conferencing software is not terribly expensive. You know, the the build the PowerPoint part, I guess, may vary. There are folks out there that will just do outsourced PowerPoint presentation, make your stuff really pretty. It's very Googleable, And and you may be good at that or have someone in the firm that's good at that. Then the, the hard part is the, you know, get a list of people to invite so that you can get a list of people who actually show up and, and participate in the webinar. But for those firms that have spent time doing things like building email lists, this is suddenly where you get the ROI on that email list you've been building for the last you know, three months or six months or 12 months or three years or five years or however long it is. It's, it's like the drip marketing newsletter list of old that if you've built up this list of people you're sending stuff to who look at it and pay attention to it, when you've actually got an event or something you want to run like a webinar event, lo and behold, you got people like ready and waiting that you can send to. And if you eliminate that part of your cost structure, this actually gets really cost effective. That's absolutely right. Yep. Absolutely. And so what, what is the format and the structure? I mean, just what do people do for online seminars of this nature? Like my, my doing an hour events, do I have to make it a shorter event in the same way that client meetings are, are, are shorter? Are there, are there particular topics that firms are doing that seem to be working? Like, what do I actually do when I say I'm ready to do an, an online educational event? Yeah, th- they are typically shorter. So anywhere, what we've seen is anywhere from 35 to 45 minutes of content, but you know, hopefully some interaction in between there and then question and answers towards the end. But 
it has to be, it really has to be shorter. You, you're not going to do an hour and a half probably and, and keep the attention. But the topics that have been working according to, you know, our research, we're asking advisors, I don't, I don't know what everyone's doing, but protecting your investments in volatile markets is one. Retirement income strategies, just retirement income strategies, the general stuff that you've talked about before, taxes in retirement is a, is a hot one. Even social security is still like, you know, advisors are doing these seminars and attracting people to come to them. You know, as a marketing person, I always think, well, you know, we know what's going to work. We don't know what's going to work. We've got to try a few things out. And then we've got to be able to look at what others are doing that's actually having some success. And maybe we can do it a little bit like that. And so those are the ones. But also interviewing a money manager has been one that's worked you know, if you have a money manager that has an interesting kind of a bend to their product or whatever, but that's, that's more specific, but it works. And that's fine. Even if you're like, you're interviewing the money manager. So it's like, now it's not me showing my expertise up there. I'm, I'm interviewing someone else's expertise that, that still works for you know, me trying to get credibility and get clients. Well, it does. It depends on how you set that up, of course, but if you set it up as this is just one of the resources and I wanted to bring this money manager as as if it's like a, a, a benefit to hear from an actual money manager who's managing, you know, some of the investments that we have that we have investigated and found and are continuing to research. And this is one that we really like. I want to have the money manager talk about it. I don't think it takes away as long as you've got a good intro and a close to it, which talks about a little bit about what you do and why you would do a meeting like this. So I, I, I don't think that anyone today expects their financial advisor to know everything, right? So I think that it's good to, to bring in other resources and show that you're bigger than just one, one advisor or one, one firm. And then talk to us about virtual client appreciation events. Like yes. what, is, what, is a, what is a virtual, I mean, I, I guess I know client appreciation event, you know, we're, we'll, we'll do a concert or entertainment event or you know, a lot of advisors like to do things at vineyards. How does client appreciation event work in a virtual environment? It's actually been successful in that when we ask advisors, okay, what are you doing and how is this working? So here's one. We have a financial advisor who said, well, I want to do a virtual event for my clients. I'm going to do virtual bingo because a lot of my clients used to go play bingo and now they can't play bingo. And so I'm going to do this virtual bingo. Virtual bingo. Like just get all, get all fucking bingo. Okay. Virtual bingo. And I'm thinking, this is not going to work. This is definitely not going to work. Not only did it work, again, I don't know what's actually going to work. I think bingo sounds really boring, but this particular advisor's clients found it very not boring, loved it. He's doing it weekly now because his clients are coming on to do the bingo and bringing their friends. He's gotten referrals. He's, you know, he's sort of expanding his market by doing virtual bingo, which I just think, oh my gosh. And he just uses a free app. I think it's called bingomaker.com or something like that. And there was a bunch of them online. Where- I was going to say, like, <laughs> is, like, is he the, is he the, like the bingo ringleader? Like, how do you set this up? But no, of course, of course, there's a website for that. Yes, there would have of course to be there is. Website. And I've actually participated in the bingo and I was surprised at a couple things. Number one, it was actually fun laugh out loud fun. And number two, I'm really bad at bingo. I didn't, I don't think you need any skill to be good at bingo. I was going to say, isn't there like, <laughs> I'm really bad at maybe it. Maybe I, it's been a long time since I played bingo, but my recollection is like, you kind of go where the card tells you to go. Like, can you, can you be good or bad at bingo? Well, as it turns out, I'm not very good at bingo. I, we played multiple, multiple games and I didn't, I never called bingo. I'm like, what is going on? But anyways, it was a lot of fun and people interact with one another. And this particular advisor is all he did was invite his clients and it's taken off. And so. And he's doing weekly, weekly bingo. Like I'm bingo. just, why well, I'm, I'm just imagining Jared, like running you know, running a weekly client appreciation event. I mean, I'm frankly, I can guarantee like anything you do for your clients on a weekly basis that they will actually show up for on a weekly basis, I can pretty much guarantee you is going to result in new business. Yeah. Because just uh, just for the level of connection and interaction you're having with with your clients, if you're engaging with them weekly, something, something's good gonna, is going to happen. 
Yep. And there's others on the game. There's there's probably seven different categories that we've uncovered for virtual events. But on the game side, there's also virtual trivia. And there's, again, there's companies out there and people who will do virtual trivia and run it for you on, on an event. TriviaHubLive.io is one of them. And the advisor that we know that did this virtual trivia event sent out emails and did a promotion on Facebook and got 30 clients in attendance, 12 prospects, and did a virtual trivia event. They're doing, did you say, like Facebook ads or just like promote it on their Facebook page? Like, yeah, just they... promote it on their Facebook page. Yep. Okay. <laughs> of like, we're doing a virtual trivia night. So, hey, you're you're locked up in a pandemic and didn't have anything going on anyways, perhaps. So come hang out with us for our virtual trivia nights. What else have you got going on? Yeah. And just build a little competition into it. And that's, yep, that's something that, <laughs> that uh, I mean, these are things I laugh because I just never thought that these kinds of things would work, but everything has changed. Literally everything has changed in marketing and what we thought wouldn't work and what I individually thought wouldn't work is definitely working. And so um, we've got to, we've got to go with what's working right now and how we can, like you said, how can we reach people weekly? Well, I mean, if you do bingo, maybe that'll do it. Depends on who your clients are and, and what they like to do. So. But it, it sounds to me, well, and again, I guess this is the point of, of client uh, appreciation events. Like uh, a lot of this is very, very social sort of stuff that we're talking about, it seems. It is the advisor, but some of the categories, the advisor doesn't need to be super social. The advisor just needs to right. set it up and say, hey, why are we doing this? But you mentioned before, like virtual entertainment or shows. <laughs> We've had advisors that have done virtual concerts. And so they're not entertaining anyone. The, the person who's doing the concert from their garage is you know, and then there has been a lot of the virtual comedy show, like Second City will do a, a virtual event. And then at the end, you can talk to the actors and stuff like that. And the advisor has brought everybody together. The advisor introduces it, but the advisor isn't in the entertainment business. The event actually is. So. Interesting. So, so what are some of the other categories you said overall, like seven categories of virtual events that you're seeing? So we've got like virtual bingo, virtual trivia. What else are firms doing that's working in this context of virtual client appreciation events? Yep. So virtual games, virtual educational events, because you can do those in sort of a, a fun way, like it's it's been done for a long time. You know, you have an actual live event and you bring in a money manager, you bring in somebody, but it's still a fun event. Well, the virtual educational events can be that same way. Virtual entertainment and shows is number three. And that's, you know, I was mentioning the comedy show or a concert or something like that. Virtual tastings is number four. And virtual tasting, like wine, I was going to say like wine tastings. Yeah. So wine tasting, but also we had an advisor share with us that they did a cook, a virtual cooking class. And it was, <laughs> it was really interesting. So it was a female advisor. She called four of her clients and said, would you want to do this cooking thing? I, you know, I'll send you the food and then we'll have the chef on and he'll, you know, share with us how to prepare it. And we'll, you know, we'll have wines that will be paired with it, but would you bring somebody? And so there were four couples that were the clients in attendance. They brought four of their friends who were referrals and they did this and they did it through, it's in North Carolina, Asheville wellness tours. And they did this tour cooking class. And it was super successful in that they got those ex those got those referrals on. And I think that she has closed two of those referral units that have come on. Now that I think the cost of this is about $75 a person or something. So this is not outrageous to get two new clients. So Yeah, well, I mean that's a monster ROI for getting two new clients. I mean getting <laughs> one client for a lot of us is could be thousands of dollars a year. Some of us even larger numbers, like I'll take $75 events into multi-thousand dollar clients all day long. Yeah. And, you know, I keep saying super successful, super successful. I'm not sharing any of the things that, I'm only sharing the things that do work because I think that's what, you know, advisors want to know. What did somebody else do that's actually working? And another one is virtual tours. So do you want to take a tour of the streets of Tokyo? 
well, yeah, I can't really go to Tokyo or any place else because I, I like to travel. So that's when we had a, an advisor do a virtual 360 tour of climbing Mount Everest. And because um, he wow. likes to climb and he's never climbed Mount Everest, but there's things that you can get online where you can actually, you know, kind of take a walk up or a hike or whatever you do to get up to the top of Mount Everest without dying. And that, you know, he walked his clients through that. So a virtual tour, Tokyo Online, tours of cities of the world, the Vatican, all sorts of different things, and even a tour of a vineyard. So it's not the tasting, but, you know, let me show you what this vineyard actually looks like. And so there's all sorts of, you know, things like that that are also working. And then the final category, number six, is virtual informal meetups. So what is what does that mean? And I didn't even know anything about this until an advisor shared that that's what they're doing. But send out an email to and made some phone calls to clients. And hey, would you, you know, would you invite a, a prospect if you know somebody, we're going to have a surprise guest on. Now, it could be a money manager, an athlete, it could be their spouse, um, but we're going to have somebody on who you are going to want to talk to. And so that that's one that sounds like outrageously that can't possibly work, but it did. The other is come on and meet the team. So we'll have our mm. team on. We're going to all be available from six to seven at this particular time. Come on, join us and You've emailed with them forever. See them for the first time. Well, that's right. And clients develop relationships with team members. And sometimes when a team member leaves, it's, it's you know, it's like, what? You can't leave. You're my person, you know? So they really have these built these relationships up with the team. And so that definitely is, is one. And there's another advisor who does Zoom birthday parties. So every month he does a birthday party and he's done this for the past three months Everybody who has a birthday in June, come on to this virtual. We're going to you know, send you a, a piece of cake to your house and we're going to celebrate your birthday online. If anyone else wants to come on and celebrate the June birthdays, feel free to do that. But just things to get people to you know, kind of have a little meetup and, and be able to see them and not have it all super formal, but doing a virtual birthday party. So that's interesting. And then seven is sponsored events. So sponsored events are meetings that are already happening. So maybe you find someone who's already doing like a yoga class or something and you sponsor it. So you come on in the beginning and say, Hey, you know, I'm financial advisor and we love that, you know, you were taking some time for your health and here's a little bit about us and we are sponsoring this yoga for you today. So virtual yoga is something that advisors are, are sponsoring. We have an advisor who sponsors their local church service. And what that actually means is that he figures out how to get this thing videoed because a lot of the church services have not been successful in being able to get it up online. And so he does that. And he, so he's the sponsor of doing that. And he's just responsible for doing the videoing and, and making sure that the word is getting out about it. So that's the seventh idea is to sponsor events and things that are already happening, which advisors have been able to do. And then you can invite your clients and other people. And right. And sort of, you know, the, you get in front of the, you know, the clients of the yoga studio because you're sponsoring it. Your you know, the yoga studio gets exposure to your clients. So they may get some, business opportunities, kind of a you know, mutual benefit opportunity for the for the two of you. But I, I guess notable, like we're not necessarily talking about let's do a joint educational event with an attorney in the area where we'll talk about advanced to play state planning strategies for, you know, complex client lives, which I guess you could sort of do in the virtual you could absolutely event do that. area if you if you if you wanted, but just the the context here, like we're you know, when you're talking about things like virtual yoga classes, I think we're we're in a different category of events than what I think most advisory firms are used to co-hosting or sponsoring or meeting up with. Yeah, that 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 is a little bit different. That's exactly right. So yeah, so there's seven different things that we found, and I I suppose that there's many many other things that that would and are working today, but. We just did a collection of the research and asked advisors and got the actual resources and who you're using for this because we wanted to put something together so that there was a way because, you know, advisors, 
it's not an easy time for, for anyone, and especially a financial advisor who's dealing with all sorts of things that they never had to deal with before. And then I'm going to put on this virtual event and I have no idea how to do it. So we wanted to make sure that we gave as many resources as we could so that advisors could take that and, and use it and do some things with their clients and have some fun and get some referrals and new clients. You know, it just it strikes me for all of these as well that they're not complex, fancy things. Like I'm, I'm not trying to put them down or anything at all, but just I feel like a historically for client appreciation events, we we tend to put a lot of pressure on ourselves. I think as advisors, like I've got some you know, fairly affluent clients, they have certain fairly high expectations. So like nice vineyards, nice country clubs, nice events, nice catering, like not inexpensive events. Cause you know, we, we don't want to feel like we're unprofessional or low quality, particularly if we're doing this for our top clients that I feel like historically, when you talk about client appreciation events, these tend to be sort of higher polished, nicer end events is what I see most firms run. And it just strikes me that a lot of what you're talking about here is much more on a simple social level than sort of a professionally produced, you know, high finish executed event, right? All the way down to literally like virtual bingo or virtual trivia, but even just virtual second city show, virtual wine tastings and cooking classes. Let's do a virtual video tour of Mount Everest <laughs> or or even just literally like a virtual meetup, just come meet the team. You've emailed with them for three years, meet them in person and hear how they're, hear what they're doing in the pandemic. What you're talking about here is a, a, a much simpler, lower stakes version of just creating social activities and social and community connection points, which I guess gets easier to do because we're in a pandemic environment. Like th this is not a complex planning process for the client. This can just literally come down to, well, if you didn't have anything else going on on Thursday, which you probably don't because there's a pandemic. So you may not be able to go out and do anything anyways. <laughs> Instead of doing whatever you're going to watch on Netflix, why don't you come hang out for our virtual trivia night? It's going to be fun. That's exactly right. And I think that the pressure for those big client appreciation events and all the money that was you know, spent on those, I think what advisors might find is that some of these things are just as entertaining for the client's it's different than it used to be. But I think that in a lot of cases, just like, you know, business travel, that might change forever. There's a lot of things that I think might change forever. And unfortunately, the hotel business probably is not going to be that good because we used to go and do these events at a hotel or something, and we're not doing that anymore. But I, I think that we can change our perspective right now because everything has changed. And you know, there, there are some higher level things like, a you know, taking a tour of Tokyo with an online guide or taking a tour of a museum with an online guide. Like these things are not, these are not average things that you would do, but it's very different than, you know, having some gourmet meal, you know, at a fancy country club or whatever. So I think that this is more entertaining. And I think that that's what people need also. It's just a little laugh and, and everyone is in the same position in a lot of ways of just being cooped up. So, so Mary Beth, share with us a little bit of just your story and, and background. You know, I mean, we talked a little bit at the beginning of just, you know, you have a marketing consulting practice called Red Zone Marketing. You, you've talked a lot as well along the way about doing a lot of research and gathering a lot of data, which don't always see from some marketing consulting firms, but you know, you, you clearly enjoy collecting some data and trying to see what advisory firms are doing in practice. So help us understand a little bit more just what what is your story and background and 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 what exactly does red zone marketing do? Yeah, so the interesting thing is you know, people will ask, well, how did you get started doing this? And I wish that there was, you know, some big business plan that I had created and this is, you know, this is exactly what I thought I'd be doing. But in reality, I started my marketing consulting firm and my fifth client just happened to be a financial advisor. I met him at a chamber of commerce networking event. I didn't know anything about the financial services business. And I said, you know, I think I can help you with your marketing. And he had, at the time he had $10 million of money under management. So he was, you know, just kind of getting started, right? And he said, well, I don't have any money to pay a marketing person. And I said, okay. He goes, but if this really works, then I'll pay you based on performance. I go, well, what does that mean? He said, well, 
it's 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 called sharing commissions. And and, and he said, uh, what we'd have to do is you'd have to get licensed. So you can actually like be on the policy along with him for a, a split rep code or a split commission. <laughs> right. So, well, so then he said, well, yeah, you, you just, you know, you could get like your series six and 65 and life acts and health. And I had no idea what he was talking about because I don't know anything about the financial industry. I mean, I had investments, but that's as much as I knew. And because he was my fifth client, I didn't have very many clients or any kind of revenue for the most part coming in. I thought, well, you know what? I, I think I'll do it. So I went and got my all my licenses, just the six. I didn't get the seven, but I got my licenses and we started marketing. So the marketing so like you got your series six in your <laughs> life and health license just so you could get paid by a client. Well, and actually just to the hope of getting paid by a client. Uh, we still had to make this stuff. Well, that's work. true. You still actually had to get some results to actually get anything going. But it's a good reminder, like no matter what industry you're in, whether it's financial advising or or marketing consulting, like starting a business kind of sucks for everyone. And we all do what we've got to do to survive. The first Exa- few exactly. Years. That, that's exactly right. And so, so we started marketing for, for him and he had a couple of niches and I thought, well, the easiest way to do this, cause he doesn't have any money to spend on marketing, but we've got to get in front of people. So he had a niche, one particular company, they had three, he ended up having three, but the first company, he had several clients from the same company. And so I got on the phone and I called the clients that he had from this particular company. And I said, what about if we did an event on how to retire from this company without making big mistakes? We did it kind of in a a seminar would you tell other people about it? And they're like, oh, sure, sure. So the two clients told other people about it. I sent them some you know, flyers some invitations and they passed them along. So we go to the very first event. We're all ready to go and uh, nobody shows up. So I'm thinking this is really bad. Like this is the Welcome worst to seminar thing. marketing. <laughs> this is the worst thing that I've ever done. Nobody shows up. And the advisor super resilient, the the best implementer I've ever seen. He said, well, that's okay. I'll just stand and do the presentation for you. I need to practice anyway. So he did the presentation for me. And I went back to the office the next day and really, really worked hard to get another one going. Now, the second one we did, we had eight people show up. Now, meanwhile, we've spent zero dollars on this. He's doing it at the community center in town. So he's not paying for the, for any kind of rent. He served checks mix that he got at like the local Sam's club. And we called people and then sent out some invitations. And so there was no cost really, but this turned into this started. And then we found two other niches where we did the same thing. We would do these. We ended up doing them weekly at some point. He went from 10 million of money under management to over 200 million in under five years. So that put me on the map. And that also meant that I finally started to get paid, but it was a while before I got paid. But now I'm fully invested in this thing, right? I'm like, (laughs) we got to get something going here. So, but he was... You know, he was willing to to not worry about that first one that didn't work at all. Because some advisors would just say, this is a disaster. I told you this wasn't going to work. And then that would be it. Did one literally got no one moving on? Yeah, right. This doesn't work, obviously. But he didn't have a lot of other ideas or strategies or anyone to do any of these things. And so we did it again. And, and we did it again and again and again. And we would do them at shift changes for when this particular company got off. So we would do one at three and we would do one at six. And it just turned out to be that it was the simplest thing. And it was so popular because if you're working at this company and you're getting ready to retire, you're going to come to this seminar. You're not going to come if you're 15 years from retirement or you just started. You're coming if you're actually qualified. So it it, it worked and that put me on the map. And so and I'm presuming just it was a large, like we're talking about a fairly large company corporation just to have a sheer enough volume of people that you can start doing yes. local events on a on a monthly and down a weekly basis and just have enough people that there are people to show up on a regular basis. Absolutely. It's got it's gotta be a bigger company and it was a bigger company. And then, like I said, it went into two others because we just took that model and just worked it in different places. And it's the simplest model. 
you know, sometimes the most complex of marketing is is just too complex for its own good. Sometimes the most simple marketing is what really works because people can hear what the benefit is going to be and decide that they want to do it. But And this really just came down to, you know, there are people in town at a large business. There are things they deal with when they retire. So we're just going to make a webinar about that and keep telling people about it over or again, not a webinar or a seminar about it. And just keep telling people about it over and over again, going through the few clients we've already got there. And you just keep repeating it and eventually it builds some momentum. That's right. And, you know, it's sort of the the simplest thing, but it, you know, that's, that's what it was. And I'm grateful for that because that led me into the industry because people said, well, if that guy can do it, I want to do that same thing. But what I found out pretty quickly, I went and spoke at his broker dealer, which led me into speaking and doing some other things. And by the way, as an aside, when I went down to talk at his broker dealer, I'd never spoken publicly before. And I did probably a three hour presentation in about 40 minutes. So I just rammed through this presentation and I have no idea why. Anything to get off that stage as quickly as you can. <laughs> just talked and talked and talked and talked and done. That led me into you know getting more clients in financial services. And then there was a wholesaler in the room that said, hey, you know, we're doing this rollout of our new product next year. Do you want to come and speak? You know, we're doing 20 events around the country. And so that led into me being more into financial services and really then eventually focusing solely on financial services. But, you know, and then speaking all over and doing that. But it it started off with one thing and it wasn't easy. It wasn't like, oh yeah, this will be great. No, I didn't get paid for like almost a year. (laughs) So that was really dumb if you look back at it. But at the same time, I remember the first check I got from him, the first decent sized check. And I brought it home to my husband and I said, we can maybe buy some furniture for the house. And he's like, what room? I said, the whole house. (laughs) And he said, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, I mean, you know, because when it started to, when it started to go, it started to go. I mean, it was like this this ball that was just rolling and the ball kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger because as we had more clients that were from that company, we had more access to them to tell their friends, hey, listen, you should come to this event. And it was surprising and amazing. But if you look back and say, would you work for free for a year? I mean, who would say yes to that? But we do what we got to do in the, in the first few years of just trying to survive. I think it makes an interesting point though, even right? Like the nature of how sort of these niches and specializations evolve, you know, you, I mean, you ended out with what is now a full specialization and focus in the financial services industry as a marketing consultant. But, you know, it came just because one of your clients happened to be in this industry and you had a good result with them. So it led you to do a little bit more in the, in the industry. And then it compounded, you know, his niche was, he had a whole bunch of clients in different places, but hey, we've got a small concentration of clients at this particular firm and there's a large market opportunity there. Let's just focus on that one and do more there. A couple of years compounding later, firm goes from 10 million to 200 million. That, you know, I, I feel like sometimes we try to overly mastermind what this like, what is the magical niche that I can pick that's going to make my business, you know, huge and amazing and wonderfully successful. And and don't recognize that so often these really just come from, I did a thing for a person, it went well, so I tried to find another person like that. And then when I got a few of them like that, I did more for them and word of mouth spread and yada, 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 niche. It, that's exactly right. And it's so simple that it almost sounds, well, that can't possibly be what you did. Well, yeah. I mean, it was just really simple and it was it was two that turned into four that turned into eight that turned into, you know, and it just kept, it just kept amassing. And that's, that's what happened. And, you know, you might say, well, maybe he was lucky. And I said, I don't know if he was that lucky because I think he was persistent is what he was. And then he gave me credit for his persistence because I didn't close any sales. He did. So, you know, I, it was a, it was a win-win for me. (laughs) So, so then help us understand like, what is, Red Zone marketing do today? And just like, what do you, what do you, what does your firm actually do if advisors are, are working with you? Like, what do they, what do they hire you to do or work with you on? Yeah. So we do a few different things. One of the things that we do, and we, we do a lot of it for transitioning firms. So if a firm is, 
you know, at one place and now they need to get a new name and they need to get a logo and they need to get a website and they need to get this whole. So we have a branding package that we'll do for firms that are transitioning to become an um, independent firm. Okay. So like I'm, I'm going from wirehouse to, to an independent model. And like, I've literally never had any of my own marketing materials. Cause I always had to use what home office sent me. Like you'll do that rebuild. Or I guess even if I'm going sometimes from one independent to another, if it's, if it involves something that has to rebuild my marketing and my back end, and I just essentially have to build all my marketing material over from scratch, like you do those kinds of overhauls. Yes, we do that. In fact, we're doing two of them this week where the advisors on Friday are going to be leaving their firms. And so we have to make sure that the website is on, that the letter is ready to go, that whatever, whatever their situation is, whatever's within the rules and we like doing that because it's fun because we get to build the whole thing and the value proposition and the name and the logo and, you know, the collateral and the website and all of that. So that's branding package is one of the things that we do. We also do strategic marketing. Now, we, we opened up this call by talking about, you know, we don't do yeah. super long term strategic marketing planning, but we work with a lot of large firms that will say, we are doing so much stuff in marketing. We're not sure what's working. We don't have our analytics down. We need someone to pull this whole thing together. And so we do that and put together an entire action plan, which suggests what you should be doing or what you should stop doing, what you should you know, continue doing, and then helping them manage all the analytics so that they can look at that themselves and say, this is working or this is not working. And so we put together an analytics model for people to track, you know, their social media, their website, their events, what's your ROI on all of these things. A lot of advisors don't necessarily know what their ROI is. They're just, they're doing it because they know that it's going to do something, but what is it actually doing and how can we improve it? So we work with firms to do that. We also work with firms that just say, we don't, we don't know what to do in marketing and we'll put together an entire marketing strategy for them. But our marketing strategies are one year. They're one year at a time. Now, some of the things might, of course, can, you know, last much longer than a right. year, but one year at a time. And then we also do just, you know, one-off projects like rewriting the messaging on a website or redoing a website for an advisor or helping put together their content marketing plan. We also do a lot of writing. Some of the some of the larger broker dealers, we've done all of their content, like a year's worth of content in their content libraries that then the advisors use. So we do a lot of content writing for uh, for firms and practice management for mutual fund companies and things like that so that they can have more resources to go take to market to the advisors. So and and so your role, like you're, you're not solely living in, I guess the, the, the advice consulting only end of things, like you're actually a little bit more of an agency model to implement and do it. Like we won't just give you advising on re redoing your website. Like we'll literally redo your website. <laughs> well, that's right. You know, okay. so some consultants will just say, here's what you need to do. Pay me a bunch of money to tell you that. And then you go, well, how am I going to get this done? We actually help with the implementation and we have some retainer agreements where we'll be with advisor and advisor uh, team for a long time. But most of the time we come in, the firm already maybe has a marketing person, some of this part-time or full-time and maybe several people, but we come in to fix, readjust and give a streamlined plan to what you should be doing for the marketing. And then we step away and let you do it. But in order to get that done, we've got to do some work on the upfront, which is what's the value proposition? We're going to write it. What's the website messaging? What's the, the website design? We're going to do that for you because then you will, you'll be set with a proper foundation to be able to go out and actually implement some of the other marketing strategies. So as, as you look at this for now having worked in our advisor world for you 20 plus years of seeing all this play out, like what do you think is the thing that that most advisory firms kind of miss or don't understand about what it takes to actually market an advisory business well? Yeah, I think there's there's a couple things. One is I hear from advisors all the time, I I don't do any marketing. I say, well, what do you mean you don't do any marketing? How are you getting new business? Well, mostly like referrals and well, that's actually marketing. You know, that's, that's actually, it's a, it's a different way of looking at marketing, but that's actually marketing. And you could get more if you had more activity related to that. And that brings me to what I think the thing 
of it is, is that a lot of advisors are really good in sales and communication and, and reaching out to clients. And they have all these great ideas to do marketing or, you know, so they either do, say they don't have any marketing or they do a bunch of stuff in marketing. But the key is implementation. Whatever you're going to do, if you actually take focus, like that advisor I talked about, the first advisor I worked with, he was an implementer. He just did whatever we came up with and he, he didn't say no and he did it even if it wasn't working and then he would figure out how to make it better. But it's the implementation of the strategies that you know are working for others. You do it once, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it's never going to work. And so sometimes we have to tweak and do things like that. So it goes from not having any marketing when you really do have marketing that you could take control of to doing a whole bunch of stuff because you've got all these great ideas and you're a real creative person and honing it in to say, what am I going to implement that's going to be the most successful? And how am I going to implement that on a consistent basis? Yeah, I mean, there's a theme to me of just this whole discussion of like, don't make marketing more complex than it needs to be. I mean, a lot of the strategies that you talked about at the end of the day are really just kind of digital versions of things that we've already done for a long time, right? Client appreciation events, but we'll take them virtual, seminar marketing, but we'll take it virtual, right? We've, we've adapted to a virtual environment, but most of these are things that firms have already done for a long time. And like, it's not necessarily a mystery of whether they work. It's just like, they work, but you just have to do them and right. do them consistently and do it for a period of time and recognize that it takes a while to get you know known or trusted or build some momentum to these, as you noted, like the the strategy that got hit, the that got the advisor from ten to two hundred million dollars literally got zero turnout on their first marketing <laughs> event. Thanks to me. That you know, <laughs> repetition to a thing that's got decent odds of working, if only because it's sort of an industry standard and works for others. So it's probably gonna work for you as well. And, and sticking with it is you know, my takeaway, like a, a lot more powerful than what I think we spent a lot of our time on trying to figure out like the perfect best marketing strategy for us and win on it the first time we take a swing. Yeah. And that's, you know, marketing is an art and a science. And unfortunately, we're not sure how much art and how much science in any given event that we do that's going to make it work. If we could just rely on the science of it, well, you know, the, the advisor down the street got 16 clients from this particular thing. So I'm going to do it and I will get 16 clients. Not true. You might get 20, you might get zero, but it's the art and the science and the combination of that and the tweaking to get it right. And sometimes it takes a little patience. And I don't know that advisors have a lot of patience for waiting for things to work. And, you know, I mentioned we're red zone marketing. We want things to work really quickly too, but sometimes it's yeah. going to take one or two shots at it to, to, to make it work. And we've got to have some patience to get strategies going that we know are working in other places that are similar to us. So... You know, having been this journey yourself, through this journey yourself, I mean, I'm always fascinated, like the, the journey that a lot of industry consultants go through in building their businesses, giving advice to advisors is really quite parallel to how we as advisors often go down our own journey, including the crazy things you say yes to in the early years, because you're just trying to get clients and revenue going. So I'm wondering, like, what was the low point for you on the journey of building your own consulting practice? You know, I think 2008, 2007 was the best year that we had ever had up until that point. 2008 rolls along into 2009 and, you know, the the bottom falls out. And I really, we we had a whole bunch of team members that were on staff at that time. We were doing lots and lots of implementation. And all of a sudden, the business was not there. And we all of a sudden had some cash flow issues. And it was not easy. And I know that advisors had sort of, you know, some of that same thing going on. But it was the hardest time that I had, I had ever had. But what it did for me is it made me change the model of our organization. So when we went into this pandemic, I thought, oh, here we go, 2008, yeah. 2009, I'm going to have to figure out cash flow and this is going to be hard and it's going to be miserable. But we had a different model set up. So we have a lot of go-to contractors that we use every week all the time, but they're not on our payroll. 
we still have a bunch of people on the payroll, but we don't have as many as we had before. And it made, it just made things a little bit easier for this time. And so that was a change that I made because I can't control what's happening with the industry, with the stock market, with, you know, the, the yeah. ability to bring on new business in a lot of cases, I know what to do to bring it on, but if everything changes, we're not going to be able to do that. And so we changed the model. So just getting really, getting really focused from the business management end of what really do you need to do with your own permanent staff, which means you have to be prepared to pay their salaries or terminate them if there's a nasty pullback versus what can you do with, with contractors and, and outsourced or externally simply so that as a business, you have more flexibility in being able to scale back your, your business expenses if there's a slowdown. Well, exactly. And we had so much revenue coming in. I never had to worry about any of that stuff. And so now, you know, talking to a bunch of financial advisors, we have more in savings. We have, you know, we have a line of credit that's open that we don't use, but we have it open in case we need it. You know, we have all of these things that we implemented because it was so bad at that time. And it, I just never thought it would ever be bad like that because it was always just this constant huge revenue source of working with advisors and helping them. And it was all great until it wasn't. And then it really wasn't. <laughs> so what advice would you give for younger or maybe even just newer advisors? Some of us career change in at a later stage. What advice would you give to newer advisors that are getting started or launching their firms today and trying to figure out how to, how to get started on the right foot with marketing? Yeah, I would pay attention to what's working for others and pick one or two things and just implement it. Now, you want to pick the probably some of the lower cost things because you don't have a lot of revenue coming in yet and you don't want to get in that position. But I would say pick one or two things that that really seem to be working for others right now, which by the way, right now is not the same as it was seven months ago, what's working, but I would, I would figure that out, what's working, and then do one or two of those things and that's it. But the other thing that I would suggest, you know, we, we, I talked before about creating the foundation for advisors is make sure that you've got that foundation. Do you have a decent, you don't need to have the best website in the world, but is it a decent website with good messaging that truly describes and differentiates you? Do you have a good LinkedIn profile? You know, th those things where you know people are going to be able to find that, make sure that that's good. You've got the foundation and then pick one or two strategies and move. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the themes that always comes up is just the, the word success means very different things to different people. And so, you know, as someone that's built, you know, objectively a, a very successful marketing consulting firm working in the advisor community, I'm just wondering now, how, how do you define success for yourself? So we don't define success in revenue. You know, I know that that that's, typically a way that you define success, but we define success in our clients having success. So if we implement a strategy for an advisor and they bring in 50 new clients over the span of, you know, X, X period of time, that's success. That's what makes it feel good. Also, when I speak, when I used to speak, you know, like in person, but now I speak online, you know, having somebody say, oh my gosh, I took an idea that you had and I put it into practice and this is what happened. That's success to me. Yes, we get paid for what we do, but if it works, <laughs> that's success. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Mary Beth, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for having this nice conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.